The Titans fell again to the Ravens this time in London. We are going to break down that game, and it's the bye week. Ryan Tannehill's hurt. What does this mean for the future of this season and beyond? This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver. With me, as always, is Justin Mello. And Justin, I'm coming to you in a hotel room from Houston. I am on the road for work covering the ALCS. Texas Rangers up two games to zero. That's my team, so pretty cool. Uh, How's it going, Justin? And yes, uh, sorry, that's why this podcast is late, coming out on a Tuesday this week. It's also the bye week, so we don't have a second podcast coming with a preview later on, but sorry we're late. I've been pretty busy here. ALCS Game 2 was yesterday, Monday, so we didn't get a chance to tape. Justin, how's it going? Listen, don't apologize to the people. I mean, this is dedication on your part. I mean, you're in a hotel room right now covering the ALCS, as you said, and not a whole lot to cover with this. No, I'm kidding. I mean, there's a lot to cover <laughs> with this Titans team. Very disappointing. I'm happy for you that at least one of your teams is playing well this year with the Rangers up 2 nothing in the ALCS. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not a huge baseball fan, but I guess uh, that's the that's what you get. You get one team to be good, and that's it. Um, anyway, <laughs> Titans lose 24-16 to against Baltimore, and it wasn't really that close. You know, they were down by... I guess, nine points with under five minutes to play, and they kicked a a dumb field goal to put it into eight, tried the onside kick thing. But I don't even really want to talk that much about this game, to be honest, Justin. It was another disaster game. I'll hit on a few things quickly if you want to comment on them afterwards. Tajay Spears had an electric catch and run on a nice screen play. That kid's going to be a really good player for this Titans team. Ryan Tannehill obviously got injured, but before that threw a really bad interception down the field. Not sure what he was even looking for. Pretty unproductive game overall for the Titans. Christian Fulton and Andre Dillard both benched uh, in the middle of this game. Nicholas Petit-Frere coming in at left tackle. Andre Dillard gave up, what, four pressures and one sack. NPF comes in and gives up four pressures and two sacks. (laughs) Um, Although some of that might be on Malik Willis. That's what PFF credited him for, but I do think some of that might be on Malik Willis for holding the ball for a long time. And that's still what we've kind of seen from Malik in this game. He, He took a bunch of sacks because he's still not processing things at the speed he needs to be. But Justin, anything from this game stand out you want to comment on quickly before we move forward? Yeah, a couple of things, actually, and I hope I don't take up too much of your time here, but um, I think I hit the nail on the head for this week's preview over at Broadway Sports. If you follow along with some of the writing that we do here as well, um, I've been writing one preview article a week over at Broadway Sports, previewing a game, trying to pick out a theme. You know, before the Bengals game, I picked out the theme of how they're 0-3 against Joe Burrow and what the numbers were and, and how they were trying to get over that hump. Against the Chargers, I hit the nail on the head, picking out a theme of how they had to get into play action, had to run the football, uh, how how the Chargers had struggled defending outside zone, and and that was the bread and butter of that game. So I think I've done a good job this year, but with this one in particular, I think I'm most proud so far because um, the, the, the headline sort of that captured a lot of attention was, a loss would bring the Titans closer to Malik Willis or Will Levis territory. That was the headline, but the body of the article specifically predicted that You know, the Titans were in a similar situation coming off a big letdown loss. Were they going to recover? And I talked about how Mike Vrabel said after the Browns loss, how, you know, Titans had a a chance to define their culture, right? And they, and, and, you know, and they did that, right? They bounced back um, by beating the the Bengals, it was, right? Yeah, following the Browns loss. Here they were again, letdown loss of the Colts. And this time I wrote, you know, similar territory. They're going to find themselves in a bounce back opportunity. But this time, I think the Titans will probably reveal who they really are. And that's a team that's not always going to bounce back from a letdown loss simply because they're a bad football team. Right? <laughs> the 23 of the Titans are a bad football team. It just is what it is. And I thought the first half of this game was an absolute nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. I mean, they went into the breakdown 18-3. Should have been 19-3, but they blocked a Justin Tucker extra point. It wasn't close at, at the half. You look at some of the sequences in this first half, and to me, again, it just summarized who the Titans are. At one point, they bring in Nicholas petit Friere. Uh, He hadn't replaced Andre Dillard yet, by the way. Right. They bring him in for a jumbo package on a Derrick Henry Wildcat. Okay? Henry rumbles off for 15 yards. What happens? It gets called back for a petit Friere illegal formation penalty. Okay? On the ensuing play, that, that puts him into a third and long instead of moving the chains, a first down explosive run, right? Uh, so third and long, incomplete pass. Predictably, 
punt the ball, 70 yard punt return for the Ravens. Yeah. So three a legal formation penalty wipes out a huge gain. Third and long incomplete. Special teams gives up a 70 yard punt return, which by the way, I bet Paul Kaharski can't wait to ask Craig Ackerman about when they get a chance uh, to talk to the Titans again about that game. So and then mo- I don't moments later, minutes later, the Ravens are punting at the end of the first half. They just, you know, the, the half is over. I had essentially got up and started to walk away. Titans got Kyle Phillips back there, which by the way is a huge error on Mike Vrabel's part. Very unlike Mike Vrabel to botch an in-game situation like this. But he did botch it by putting Kyle Phillips back there. When he there was like three seconds left on the clock, you're not going to make anything positive happen. Right. Even if they got the what are they going to do? Take a knee. Right. Yeah. So there, there's no point in having a punt returner back there. Everyone should sell out to try to block the punt, right? That's your last opportunity to make a game changing play. You block the punt, return it for a touchdown. That's the only chance you have. Of course, chances of that are slim to none. It's still your best bet, right? Don't even have one back there. Well, he has Kyle Phillips back there. That's a mistake. And not to absolve Kyle Phillips of blame, because guess what? He's got to catch the friggin' punt every time he's back there. That's the job, right? What does he do? He botches the punt. He, uh, the Bengals, uh, sorry, the Bengals, the Ravens recover it, hit a field goal to end the half as time expires. Just, just an embarrassing, a comical blunder of errors throughout this first half that summarizes Titans football. Uh, it got better in the second half. They outscored the Ravens 10, nothing in the third quarter gave you false hope <laughs> that they were potentially going to mount a comeback. Uh, that include, I think after the Derrick Henry touchdown run, they end up getting Sean, uh, an interception from off Lamar Jackson, yeah. for Sean Murphy bunting, really good heads up play. Looks like miscommunication between uh, Jackson and the receiver, but he makes a great interception near the sideline, taps his feet inbounds, comes down with it, has the Titans in great field position. I believe that's when they settled for a field goal on that ensuing drive. Uh, typical, again, red zone struggles, right? What were they in this game? Maybe one for four, one for five in the red zone. Uh, the, the year-long struggles continue. They settled for three Nick Folk field goals, all three of which I believe were under 40 yards, which means they were in pretty damn good field position every single time. One for four. One for four, I was right. So the three Nick Folk field goals, uh, I believe, were all uh, as a result of drives where they were in the red zone. So, to, again, they've been horrible in the red zone this year, continued here. And then, as you said, putting the nail in the coffin – was the Ryan Tannehill interception where he severely underthrew, I believe it was Chigakonkwo uh, on a deep ball attempt, easily intercepted. That ended the comeback efforts right then and there. I don't even think Tannehill should have been in the game at that point. He was Agreed. severely limping yep. from the ankle injury. And then he, it's not like he re-aggravated it later. Like they removed him. He was carted off the field eventually yeah. without anything else happening. Like he shouldn't have been in the game at that point. You can, you know, maybe absolve him of some blame because he shouldn't have been playing when he threw that, uh, you know, under ball interception. But uh, two and four, stare, uh, entering the bye week, not in a good place, not where you want to be. You got questions um, regarding the health status of your quarterback, which I think you and I are about to get into and should be the theme of this episode. But uh, I hit the nail on the head. They were not going to experience a bounce back win here. It was another letdown. This is who they are. They're two and four. They're not a good football team. So really quickly before we get into it, let's just continue the parallels from the 2019 season. It was week six, 2019, Titans about to become two and four when they benched Marcus Mariota and inserted Ryan Tannehill. Well, this wasn't exactly a benching uh, this season because Tannehill obviously got hurt. But what what are the chances that this is the week he gets hurt and the backup quarterback is inserted? And Malik Willis didn't necessarily look better than Tannehill. But if you look at his like yards per drive and stuff, because purely because of the long Tajay Spears catch and run that Malik Willis didn't really do anything on, except... I mean, a tiny bit of credit because he gave him a nice screen ball, but like every starting quarterback should be able to do that. (laughs) So he didn't necessarily look better, but I mean, whatever. He got the offense down in scoring position there late. Not enough, of course. The question is, will Tannehill be ready to go in week eight when the Titans host the Atlanta Falcons in their Oilers throwbacks, by the way? Or will he still be hobbled? Personally, I don't think the Titans should put Tannehill out there again until he's fully healthy. And at that point, I don't think they should put him out there again this season. We've been talking about this since the first loss of the year. Well, maybe since the second loss of the year. The Titans need to see what they have in these two quarterbacks, the rookie, Will Levis, and Malik Willis as well, to know what they're going into with this offseason. Tannehill's on the last year of his contract. You have a loaded uh, draft class full of potentially good quarterbacks, deep draft class that you could get a potential starter on day two in this class because there's so many guys that have high upside. 
But if the Titans think that they are okay with Levis or Willis, they won't draft one of those guys. So you got to know. You have to know if, if one of these guys can be a, pot- a potential franchise uh, future quarterback starter. So the question is, does Malik Willis start week eight? Do they use the bye week to get Will Levis up to speed to start week, start week eight? Or does Ryan Tannehill, one of the toughest players in the league, try to just gut it out and play through another sprained ankle? It is interesting to note he will not need surgery this time. It's the same ankle he hurt last year. He had to get surgery to end his season last year. He does not need surgery. That's been reported by Jeremy Fowler. Um, so there is a chance he could be back in two weeks, two to four to five weeks, even if he misses time like last season when Malik Willis filled in for a few games. Are we looking at that kind of season again? Well, wasn't it the same outcome as last year? Because he didn't have the surgery the first time he heard right. either, right? He was out a couple of weeks, came back, re-aggravated it. That's when he had surgery, went on season ending IR. So it's 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 very similar, right? Yeah. To that. It's it's equally it's the same, essentially, right? As well, <laughs> yeah. I would go as far as saying. Um another note regarding the offseason plans, and I don't want to get into this yet, but um, not only do you need to find out because it's a good class and you might want to draft one of those quarterbacks if you're going to have a high pick, which it looks like they will, yeah. uh, but you also it also impacts your plans in another way because if this can be one of your guys, and look, they should probably do this anyway, maybe, but if one of these guys can be your guy, it's also a really good class of offensive tackles right. in the first round. There are a lot of really good tackles, like the Notre Dame kid, uh, the Penn, Penn State, State. Kid, they're the two best. They're underrated tackles. Remember I said it, because you will remember it during draft season. Uh, the kid from Oregon State and the kid from BYU are not getting enough attention. I think both of them are probably first-round picks uh, as of right now. I really like both of those guys from what I've seen so far. I can't pronounce either of their names. I'm not going to try it. <laughs> if you look them up, you'll know who they are. We'll BYU learn that kid. by... We'll learn how to do that by February. <laughs> exactly. The BYU kid. And there's the Georgia kid, too, Amarius Mims, by the way. That's quite good as well. So this is a really good tackle class. So if one of those guys is your quarterback, you can hopefully draft a left tackle in the first round instead and, and shore up the protection for your young uh, playmaker. But uh, I am fascinated by what the Titans are going to do here. I am fascinated because they, they could literally go in all three directions, in my opinion. Now, when Mike Rabel spoke with the media – He seemed to insinuate that if Ryan Tannehill is healthy, he's going to be the quarterback. Um, I trust Mike Vrabel with that, and I don't, in all honesty. Yeah, yeah. Because, first of all, I'm not convinced that Tannehill is going to be healthy enough to start that game in Week 8. I mean, look, the bye week certainly helps, and there is a possibility that he will be, but but I I think it's going to take longer than what do they've got – 14, 15 days, right, in between games. Like, I, I don't know that that's going to be long enough. As you said, he's very tough, so I, I could see a scenario where he toughs it out. Um, but if I were to make a guess, and I'm purely guessing, it's far too early to say, I'm going to guess he's not healthy enough to start that game against the Falcons. And then, so, But that's one direction they could go in. And then, of course, the other two is choosing either of the quarterbacks. Look, um, Will Levis was not active for that game against Baltimore. He was the emergency third string quarterback, which means he could only enter the game if Malik Willis gets hurt. Um, Malik Willis, quote unquote, won, or sorry, air quotes, I should say, won the backup job heading into yeah. the season, partially because Will Levis wasn't healthy, didn't play the last two preseason games, didn't have those crucial reps. I would hope they've spent the previous six weeks, seven weeks, whatever, getting him up to speed, right? It's not just something you do now. I hope you spent the entire season trying to get him up to speed because that's the job, right? To prepare him to play if he has to play. Um, certainly the pecking order would suggest they would go to Malik Willis. Um, again, you know, he's been the backup. He's the one that came into the game again by default this past week. I'm going to be honest. It's harsh. I, I feel like I've seen enough Malik Willis in all honesty, right? Like he took four sacks on 12 dropbacks after coming into that game. And yes, he showed some playmaking ability. He, he had a big scramble. He rushed, he, you know, escaped the pocket on occasion. Um, a lot of his completions, in all honesty, were low throws. Titans did a great job. The receivers did, you know, scooping those balls off the ground. I think Nick westbrook Akine was on the receiving end of one of them, and I think Chig was on the other. They were not good, accurate throws. Obviously, the majority of his yardage coming on the screen to Tajay Spears. Um, I, I, I'm ready to see Will Levis. I am. Yeah. I think... I think I'm at a point where Malik, you know, and again, I know it probably sounds totally unfair. I just don't, and I hope I'm wrong. I just don't have a ton of confidence that Malik Willis is a starting caliber quarterback in this league. I think he's a viable backup quarterback. Like, I I don't think this is so bad where he's going to be out of the NFL 
or deserves to be out of the NFL. No, I think he's a viable backup quarterback. He brings some of that, you know, off script playmaking ability that you like to have. He's just, I, I'm seeing the same issues, right? And again, he, you know, he came off the bench cold again, maybe I'm being unfair. I, I want to open up the possibility to that came off the bench cold, but I'm seeing the same issues dating back to last year, right? Where he's not processing quickly enough. He's holding onto the football. I mean, four sacks and 12 dropbacks is, is bad, right? It's really bad. It's abysmal. And, and I, I encourage everyone to go watch uh, No Flags film on Twitter. James Foster, he posted a phenomenal minute and a half breakdown of all four Malik Willis's sacks. And God, Petit mm. Friere was terrible. Yeah, on all of them at left tackle. But wait, really quick. Uh, there's one. One of those is on Peter Skaronsky, and it's being misplaced onto NPF. Over. Yes. So one of those, the uh, the pass protection was the entire line sliding to the left. So you'll yes. see NPF let the guy to his right come free and slide to his left and pick up. I think it was like a twist to the outside and pick up the guy on the outside. And Peter Skaronsky doesn't come over to the left. It's it's a yes. rookie mistake. It's a mental mistake by Skaronsky there. Absolutely. But point taken. NPF was and terrible. I'm not, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm not saying all four sacks were on P, NPF. Sorry. I don't think that James Foster's video insinuates that, but he didn't look great right throughout those four, throughout that montage um, that, 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 that uh, James Foster posted. Um, but certainly there was opportunities throughout that montage for Malik Willis to get rid of the football earlier. Right. And a lot of them, honestly, they weren't as egregious as I thought they were live. Like, it felt like he was holding onto the ball for five, six, seven seconds. Like, it, it didn't look great live. But, you know, going back, looking at that tape, these were split-second decisions that he didn't make, that he has to make, right? But at the end of the day, that's the difference in the NFL, right? That's the difference between a great quarterback and a not-so-great quarterback. It's making those split-second decisions. Because you know what? Everything in the NFL is done with slim margins, right? Windows are tight. Opportunities to get rid of the football are, again, split-second decisions. And if you can't make those decisions on time, if you can't process, you get sacked, right? You you throw in or you, – you do – you do what you do that results in negative plays, right? Is what I'm trying to say. So that's the difference in the NFL. The margins are so slim. So I just don't have any, you know, a lot of remaining faith that he's capable to get past those issues. So for me personally, I, I'm ready to see Will Levis. He is, in my opinion, the the number one hope on the roster that you could have a future starting quarterback. I mean, you have no idea. Right. Whereas you've got a pretty good sample size on Malik. The sample size thus far doesn't suggest starting caliber quarterback um, with Will Levis. You don't know. I mean, he might be worse than Malik Willis. Right? <laughs> but the point is, you don't know. And you have to find out what you don't know. Right. And I want to address something that I've seen on Twitter um, because it seems like. Uh, people are wondering if you're going to start Will Levis week eight, why wasn't he your backup quarterback? And I think people are missing something. This happens all the time. Will Levis is a rookie. You don't want to throw him into a game, middle of the game, no preparation, no warm up, with no idea that that's coming. Malik Willis has at least been in these situations before. He's had a few starts under his belt and a few games where he had to come in in relief under his belt. So he's done this a few times. He's right. your best option middle of the game to insert. That doesn't necessarily mean he's your best option to start, especially if you have an, a whole extra week with this bye coming up to prepare Will Levis to start. So I'm totally on the same page with you. I know it's like sort of quick judgment. How many games has Willis even started now? Like what, four or five? How many times has he been in the in the game? Seven or eight times total? Like... It seems like a small sample size to judge, but, and yeah, he looked a little bit better in the preseason, but like you said, there's still all the same issues we saw back in his very first start. I don't think that he has shown enough to say that we should go with this guy and maybe it's being unfair to him. Maybe it's too small of a sample size, but I just don't see how he's going to continue to get to where you need him to be, even if he does continue to show gradual improvement. So I'm fully with you. Let's see. You drafted Will Levis in the second round. Rumors were you wanted to trade up into the first round. You traded up in the second round. Rumors were you wanted to trade back into the first round to get this guy. Show why you did that. Let him have a chance to start that week eight game and just see if he's terrible. Maybe you chalk it up to his first start. Maybe you give him another week and see, you know, give him four or five games, see how he does. And if he is just absolutely awful, maybe you go back to Willis and give him another chance. But whatever happens, I do not think the Titans should go back to Ryan Tannehill. I'm just worried that Mike Vrabel 
is a prideful coach who, you know, wants to win games and you obviously wants to keep a culture of winning mentality in the locker room. Yeah. And if you sort of, you know, quote unquote, give up on the season, then how do you keep guys like Jeffrey Simmons, who was quoted after the game saying there's people here, there's players in this locker room that I don't think want to be here. I mean, he didn't say exactly that, but he insinuated it. Uh, and w- we think he's talking about Tier Tard, who hasn't played in two games, but who knows if that's the case. Um, how do you keep guys like him happy? He just signed a mega contract. You don't want you don't want your studs to go out and request a trade because they sense a rebuild on the horizon, right? I think the biggest risk there that you bring up that probably worries Mike Vrabel the most is he's such a strong-minded coach and a, a, a you know a, a strongly voiced, highly opinionated coach that's done such a good job to build this culture. I think the biggest thing he probably worries about and fans underrate this possibility is the message no longer landing, right? Right. When guys start tuning you out because you're losing a ton of football games, it's hard to take that message seriously when you're not winning, right? I think that would probably be his biggest fear. Although I, I, I do ultimately agree with you that there's no point in going back to Ryan Tannehill this year. And look, if he's not healthy enough to start in Atlanta and they lose that game, whether it's Levis or Willis and you're two and five, and then he's healthy enough to come back, there's still no point of bringing him back because you're two and five, you're in the middle of a wasted campaign, and there, there, there's, you know, you're, you're headed for a lost season. It, the inevitable is the inevitable at that point, with or without right. Tannehill. You've got to find out, and Rand Carthon will want to find out, right, about yeah. the young quarterbacks. I'm going to let think... you uh, – give me one second here, if yeah, you yeah. don't mind, before I forget this point because you just talked about it. You made a really good point, and then I'm proud of myself for thinking of a good point to build on it <laughs> because you talked about how Malik Willis enters that game uh, potentially, or he's the one that's active because you you know he's been in there before, and you don't want to throw in a you know a young guy, an even younger guy that is, and Will Levis with no experience. That's a really good point that I hadn't thought of. And then as soon as you said it, I don't know how I thought of this, but I was reminded of an example around the league earlier this year that I think is fairly similar. Uh, when the Raiders were going to play the Chargers a couple of weeks ago and they knew Jimmy Garoppolo was not going to start that game, they had enough time. Who did they start? They started their rookie quarterback, Aiden O'Connell, in that game, right? They had yeah. days to prepare for that, a week to prepare for that, essentially. Well, this past weekend, who was active for them in an in-game situation? It wasn't Aiden O'Connell. It was the veteran journeyman, Brian Hoyer, who's, yep. a, again, a, 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 what has he been in, the 27 years? Brian Hoyer's been <laughs> in the NFL, give or take. Um, it wasn't Aiden O'Connell because they didn't want that young quarterback to be in that situation, even though he already had a start in his, right. his belt. They still didn't want him to be in that situation. So uh, this is sort of a league wide thing, I think, that you would see. And the last point I want to make is um, it's obvious, but we haven't really said it. There's no better point than to pre- there's no better point to prepare Will Levis and to make a quarterback change than on a bye week. Right, yeah. like you, you've got two weeks essentially to prepare Will Levis for his first career start. There's a big difference between that having e- even one week to prepare, and certainly a big difference between throwing him into the middle of a game, um, like they would have in London if he was active. So, no better time to make a quarterback change. Um, the time is now. Yeah, I think ultimately Rand Carthon has to make this call because, again, we don't know what's going on. We don't know the conversations, but I think personally, if it were up to Mike Vrabel. He would get Tannehill back out there as soon as possible. Say, look, the division is still He's within reach. Way. We can win the division potentially at seven and nine, eight or seven and ten, eight and nine. This isn't a strong division. We go on a five-game winning streak to end the season. Once Tannehill comes back, we have a chance to win the division. Taylor Lewan was on a K Adams show up in Adams this week talking about how 2019 the Titans were two and four, and what did we do that year? We went on to the AFC Championship. Of course, he fails to mention that they had a veteran quarterback who was. Uh, criminally underrated throughout his career, ready to come in and take the, over that team. They had uh, Arthur Smith and they had Taylor Lewan, a good left tackle. They had a much better roster in 2019, I think. A.J. Brown was still on the team. Uh, so this team... Nine day difference. I yeah. rolled my eyes at that clip, yeah. by the way, because I was like, this is not the same. This team is not going to the AFC Championship. I don't care no. who takes over. Unless Will Levis is Josh Allen right away, this team's not going to the <laughs> AFC Championship. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, Lewan also made a good point on that, though, that some of the struggles this team is seeing, there's a lot of new faces, a lot of guys gelling. There's been a lot of roster turnover this year. It's hard to just get all those guys together and be a winning team right away. And I think maybe personally, I underrated that coming into the season, putting out a YouTube video saying the Titans will win the AFC South. Like 
I didn't realize the Titans were bad. I wouldn't have made that video if I realized how bad they were. Um, so, yeah, hopefully the Titans do make the changes we want to see as fans and give us the information we need and that they need going into the offseason. But I want to close out this pod with a prediction. Who starts week eight? Not who you think should, who you think does. Wow, that's so hard. I'll go first. I say Malik Willis starts. I want to see Will Levis so bad, but I think they're going to put Malik Willis, Willis back me. out there week eight. Yeah. I'm going to go Ryan Tannehill. I, wow. don't feel good. I don't feel good about any of the predictions, right? I don't, <laughs> in all honesty. I, I, none of them. It's a 33% chance each way, the yeah. way I see it right now. But And I know I said I don't think he's going to be healthy enough. And I, I my you know, my gut says he won't. But, but, you know, based on Rabel's comments and, you know, Tannehill's history of gutting it out, having the bye week, Two and four, I think you said it. They don't view this year as a lost year yet. They are not there, right? And and at two and four, it's not. You know, if you're a good football team in this division, you could get back yeah. into the thick of it, right? I just don't think they're a, a good football team that could yeah. get back into it. I just don't. But it, you know, theoretically speaking, it's not, right? And, and Rabel said, by the way, the other day, and this surprised me, that last time they were two and four, that he spent a lot of time reading all of the negative social media comments, even to his team, when they were two and four and they went on to the AFC championship game and look, it's his job. He has to believe right. that they're capable of doing that. Right. That's the job. So, and it's his job to try to get them there and prepare them to get there. Right. So I lean towards Ryan Tannehill gutting it out, but I, I wish you never asked the question because I don't feel <laughs> good about it. Uh, 33.3% chance the way I see it. I, I've got no clue. Yeah, well, we will see. Um, the YouTube channel is going to be a little quiet this week. As I mentioned, I'm on the road. Don't have a whole lot of time to make the videos I would love to make you usually. Um, but we will be back next week, probably later in the week, to preview the Week 8 game against the Falcons. So we'll be back for that one. That'll be probably the next video and pod that gets posted. But thank you all for wa uh, watching and listening to this one. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, the Music City Audible. And we'll be back when I said we'll be back. Follow Justin on Twitter at JustinM underscore NFL. Follow me at Titans Film Room. Until next time, y'all stay safe out there and tighten up. A Broadway Sports Media Production.